Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's video, I want to talk about a report that the Bank of Russia has released that is looking at the prospects for the Russian economy going forward and talk specifically about the challenges that Russia now faces with regards to technology and a variety of related sectors. So in this video, I'll run through the details of what that report says. I'll pick out a couple of really interesting points that have been made regarding the shuttle trade, which was something that was seen in the early 90s from Russia, and also the concept of reverse industrialization. I'll then go on to talk about two specific sectors that are going to be heavily impacted, aviation and medical equipment. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think will happen to the Russian economy going forward and what the implications of that are for the global economy. So before we get into all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, and also please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I always include chapters. So if there's a section you're not that interested in, it's really easy to skip over it. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look in the description below where you'll find links to both Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon and also the YouTube Super Thanks feature. And just a quick point on Super Thanks because I've only just switched on that feature. Thank you very much to everybody who's contributed to the channel using Super Thanks. As you'll know, if you've done so, I will always respond directly to you with a personal message. The Bank of Russia's research department has published this report on the state of the Russian economy and looking at the potential impacts of all of the sanctions that have been applied against Russia. In the most detailed official statement on the outlook since the war started, the report states that the depth of the contraction may be quite significant and exit trajectory drawn out in time because the supply shocks triggered by sanctions are unlikely to fade quickly. The report states that sanctions are driving Russia into its longest recession in years and is forecasting a fall of 9.2% in GDP and for inflation to rise to 22% in 2022. And you can see from this graph that the war is therefore forecast to have a significantly greater impact than the COVID-19 pandemic. The sanctions that were brought in against Russia in 2014 following the Crimea annexation and even the global financial crisis back in 2009. So that really highlights how serious all of these sanctions are on the Russian economy. The report states that the current recession is of a transformational structural nature and will be bigger in scale and length in all scenarios than the last one triggered by COVID-19 lockdowns in 2020. Now, these statements are really interesting because the Kremlin continues to be upbeat about Russia's future prospects. However, this report from the research department is far more negative. In terms of the impact on industry, the report goes on to say that the slowdown is showing up mainly in surveys of companies due to the fact that companies have large supplies of stock that they built up before the 24th of February when the invasion started that they have not exhausted yet. However, that will not last as sanctions will cut supply chains and Russian companies scramble to make up for components that are no longer available. Over time, machinery and equipment will wear out for lack of spare parts, reducing efficiency. The business slowdown will flow into falling demand, job cuts and falling income, further weakening the economy. Domestic production isn't likely to surge to replace the missing output at this stage. Imports, especially of consumer goods, will shift to the shuttle trade seen in the 1990s, when Russians en masse flew to China, Turkey and other markets to bring back goods to sell on open markets. The small purchasing volumes and complicated logistics will make those imports more expensive and mean that it's impossible for them to replace traditional suppliers. Inflation will inevitably accelerate temporarily and the worst of the contraction in output, incomes and jobs is likely to happen roughly by the end of 2022. After that, several years of reverse industrialization will begin as companies seek alternatives to the technologies cut off by sanctions. 
the technological and economic efficiency of the equipment produced will be less than current ones. Ecological standards will also fall as emissions and waste grow. Ultimately, the adaptation process ends with equilibrium and development at a new, less technologically advanced base. So this report is painting a very negative outlook for the Russian economy over the next few years, and particularly focusing in on technology and the impact that the lack of imports is going to have directly on the growth of the Russian economy. So let's go on to talk about some of the points that have been raised in a bit more detail. The reference to the shuttle trade from the early 1990s in this report is really interesting and I thought it was worth touching upon that briefly. So back in the late 1980s, Russia was going through a whole restructuring program which was referred to as perestroika and it was aiming to move from the old communist structure towards a more capitalist environment. And during that period, you were still unable to buy a lot of Western goods in Russia. Now, at that time, the restrictions on travel were relaxed and a lot of Russian citizens travelled to other countries around Europe, bought a lot of goods and then brought those goods back into the country. And those goods would then be sold on to other Russians. So this concept was coined the shuttle trade and was essentially an unofficial way of importing a lot of goods that you just couldn't buy in Russia at that time. Now, clearly, that black market way of bringing goods into the country was really just a reflection of the restrictions at that time and the lack of available technology in Russia at that point. Now, clearly, Russia has developed a lot over the last 30 years, but it is amazing that this official research report is predicting that the economy may return to this concept of shuttle trade whereby private individuals will need to go to countries around the world, buy goods that are not available in Russia and bring them back, smuggle them back into the country and then sell them on the black market. It's astonishing in this day and age to think that that is actually one of the ways that technology will be brought back into Russia going forward. Probably the most concerning statement from this report is that Russia is facing years of reverse industrialization. Now, I've touched on this in other videos, but the problem that Russia and also other countries around the world would have in their situation is that the global economy is dependent upon technology being at the cutting edge. And Silicon Valley is generally accepted as the place around the world where most of the technological advances take place. There are other places, obviously, but that's really the, the hub. That's where everybody focuses their technological knowledge. And it makes absolute sense that everybody wants to benefit from the latest technology. So Russia, along with the rest of the world, is utilising all sorts of tech that's been designed by other countries. And the problem that they're facing right now is that the sanctions are targeting that tech and preventing them from being able to access any of it going forward. And without access to that technology or the ability to be able to replace it, then that means that everything will start to slow down and potentially go backwards in Russia. And that's what this concept of reverse industrialization is referring to. It means that whilst the rest of the world is carrying on with its development and moving forward, Russia potentially could start going in the opposite direction. Russia is highly reliant on imports of high-tech goods and imports around $19 billion worth annually. 45% of those imports come directly from the EU, 21% from the US, only 11% from China and 2% from the UK. The largest import categories are aerospace goods, which account for around $6 billion worth of imports, and IT and communication goods, which accounts for about $4 billion. This table shows a breakdown of the different categories of goods that were imported. And you can see there are a variety of different sectors that are impacted here, including aerospace, electronics, IT, manufacturing, life sciences, biotech and nuclear technology. These two pie charts show that breakdown in a different format. And you can see the spread of different sectors that will be impacted by the removal of these technology imports. And on the right hand side here, you can see the exposure that the aerospace business has to the USA, predominantly because Airbus and Boeing are the major exporters of all of the parts and equipment for aircraft. 
Semiconductor chips are the brains behind the technology in so many different products these days. Everybody's familiar with the fact that cars have a lot of electronics which are driven by these chips, but virtually every single electrical appliance these days has some form of chip within it. So the world has become highly dependent on these microchips. And this dependence was exposed recently when we had a shortage of chips during the pandemic period. And we saw the production lines of vehicle manufacturers and other businesses grind to a halt because they simply couldn't get hold of the chips that they needed. Now the chip sector is dominated by a number of large businesses and the more sophisticated a chip is, the higher the level of technology and the higher the likelihood that that chip is owned by a company in the US or it's licensed out to other chip manufacturers. And the sanctions that have been introduced by Russia are designed to ensure that they cannot access that higher level technology. Russia relies on chip imports for a lot of its industry and has been attempting to develop its own semiconductor businesses, but with limited success. Domestic manufacturing capacities in Russia remain very limited and it does not produce any high-end semiconductors. The US has imposed curbs on the import of such chips through the restriction of trade technologies made with US origin software. These type of restrictions have an extraterritorial reach. If a semiconductor is produced in Taiwan using US software, as most semiconductors are, the Taiwanese firm will need an export license from the US to be able to sell to Russia. Other countries have followed suit in sanctioning Russia via export restrictions and have also targeted semiconductor technologies because of their strategic importance. Depriving Russia of access to its chip supply in this way will severely affect the outlook of almost all industrial sectors. So this is why the Bank of Russia's research department is predicting reverse industrialization, because it knows that this technology is going to be switched off for Russia and it just doesn't have the capability to be able to generate it itself. Now, you may be watching this thinking, that's fine, they'll just source all of the chips from China. Well, they won't be able to do that for two reasons. Firstly, China will be under the same restrictions. They will need to have licenses to be able to produce this level of technology. And secondly, China knows that the US is watching this and China doesn't want to come under sanctions in the same way as Russia has. So there will be an effective cutoff of this technology and that means that Russia is going to face a period where it just doesn't have the technology that it used to have access to. One of the sectors that will be most heavily impacted by the sanctions is aviation. And that's predominantly because the two big giants in the world of aviation, Boeing and Airbus, are both American companies. And that means that Russia will no longer be able to access any parts or machinery for its existing fleet of aircraft. Finding alternatives to Western aviation technology will be an impossible task in the near and medium term. Airbus and Boeing enjoy a duopoly for larger airplanes and key components like their engines are produced by Western companies. The market for regional airliners is more contested and Russia and China are trying to enter this market segment but Chinese and Russian-built regional jet airliners are heavily reliant on Western components. For the Russian-built Sukhoi Superjet 100, Western parts are estimated to account for more than half of the unit costs. While there are plans to replace them and double the Russian share of value added to 30%, this will be too little, too late to save Sukhoi Superjet 100. Interestingly, China has also refused to provide parts. Older Soviet and Russian aircraft could fly for longer, but it's hard to see how the Russian aviation industry could sustain its international and domestic business. The combination of an embargo of aviation technology and the exclusion from lucrative markets will clip the wings of Russian aviation. A final point I wanted to touch on is medical supplies. The EU is the main provider of medical goods to Russia. This chart shows the import breakdown of biotechnology and life sciences goods for Russia. And as you can see, the EU accounts for around 60% of all imports. However, for pharmaceuticals in particular, it accounts for around 90%. 
which is in line with current global patterns of specialization. Now, sanctions have not directly targeted medical goods for humanitarian reasons, but financial sanctions and the collapse of Russian purchasing power will make it difficult to import medical goods. Even locally produced pharmaceuticals rely on foreign imports and technologies that have become difficult to obtain. And there have been reports that stocks of some pharmaceuticals such as insulin are running short in Russia. Now, all countries in the world are obliged by the Geneva Convention to ensure access to medical treatment is not inhibited. Medical goods are therefore not included in the sanctions, but NATO-aligned countries must also consider steps to ensure that untargeted measures like financial sanctions do not impede Russia's access to medical goods. So I think that's a really interesting point, that the Geneva Convention means that all of the countries of the West need to keep supplying medical equipment and pharmaceuticals to Russia. However, the practicalities of being able to do that under the current sanctions are making it difficult, and there is a real risk that Russia could run out of certain medicines and pharmaceuticals. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because we've seen a report generated directly by the Bank of Russia, which stipulates that the sanctions are definitely going to have a massive impact on the Russian economy. A lot of businesses in Russia built up significant amounts of stock prior to the invasion, which is an interesting development, and I don't know whether or not they were instructed to do that by Moscow, or whether they just had a feeling that something was going to happen, but there was certainly some planning done by a lot of companies, which has been beneficial to them in the short term. However, as the Bank of Russia Research Department have stated, those supplies will run out at some point, most likely Q2 or Q3 2022. And at that point, we will then start seeing the impact of these sanctions. And that's likely to lead to falling productivity, falling numbers of jobs, falling income and falling GDP in Russia. So that sounds like a normal recession. However, the sting in the tail here is the lack of technology. And the fact that the Bank of Russia have stated that Russia could potentially now enter reverse industrialization is one of the biggest negatives that I've heard coming out of the war. Nobody wants to go backwards in terms of technology. We all want to keep moving forward. We all want the latest developments and we want things done quicker and faster and in a more efficient way. And you want to buy things that move with the times. You don't want to be going backwards in terms of technology. That is a really regressive step for any society to take. And I think it's quite grim. And the fact that we're talking about the return of the shuttle trade, people having to travel overseas to countries to buy equipment and goods to take back and then sell on the black market is really quite depressing, I think, particularly if you're Russian or you've been to Russia, because it just means that that economy is going to be frozen in time. It's almost like a return to what we had in the 70s and 80s in communism, where the Western world was developing lots of modern and exciting equipment and the Soviet Union just wasn't moving at that same pace. So I think this is a really interesting report and it highlights the fact that the world is now completely interlinked and we're all dependent on some genius somewhere coming up with some new way of doing something and then selling that idea to other companies to be able to use it in their goods and services. And what we're seeing here is Russia is being forced out of that global society. So they'll no longer be able to share in the benefit of what's being done, all of the latest developments. They'll have to develop their own own technology. And when you've got only 144 million people, it's very difficult to be able to have all of the specialism and expertise in your country. And what Russia is also likely to see is a brain drain. It's likely that anybody who is a genius, who does want to work at the forefront of technology, is likely to leave Russia to go to Silicon Valley or somewhere else around the world, work in that specialism, and then maybe go back to Russia at some point in the future. But in the near term, in the short term, over the next couple of years, Russia is going to go backwards in terms of technology, and that's going to have a big impact on all of its industry, because industry is highly dependent on semiconductors and microchips and technology. So if you don't have all of that new technology, it means that your industry is going backwards and therefore won't be able to compete with the rest of the world.
So it's a really interesting report and it really gives you a different perspective on the impact of this war on Russia in terms of what the impact on the global economy will be. Well, Russia's main form of exports are raw materials. It's gas and oil and a lot of other commodities. So none of that requires any real form of technology. So from that perspective, I don't think we'll see a major negative impact directly on the global economy. Obviously, the higher prices for all of those commodities that we've seen during the war is pushing up inflation, which is putting more pressure on all of the economies around the world. And it's very likely that we could see a global recession kick in as a direct result of that. But in terms of this report and Russia's reverse industrialization, that won't really have any direct impact. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video, you found it useful, informative and educational. If you did, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hey guys, it's the Joe Blogs 2 part of the video again. It's only for the hardcore who watch all the way to the end, so thank you very much if you're one of those people. I was asked the question just recently, what's Joe Blogs 2? I've been watching all of these updates and I don't really understand what you're talking about. Well, Joe Blogs 2 is a new channel that I've set up that I want to offer the opportunity for people who are thinking about doing some videos, thinking about getting involved in YouTube, to be able to fast forward your journey and to earn some revenue directly from your first video. And the way that I'm going to do that is this new channel, I've called it Joe Blogs 2, just as a working title. We will change the name of it at some point in the near future. But Joe Blogs 2 is close to being monetized. And if you don't know what that is, on YouTube, you have to have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time to be eligible to apply for their monetization program and then get paid for future videos. So we're quite close to getting to that point. We're not quite there yet though, and I do need to ask you to watch a few more videos, which I'll do in a minute. But once we get to the monetization position, I'm going to open up the channel to all of you guys. And if you want to make some videos, you can send them to me. I will post them onto Joe Blogs too, and I will share the revenue from your video directly with you. So the benefit for you is that it means you can earn money directly from one video, from just posting one video. And that's going to be an exciting opportunity. It will give you the chance to be able to see whether your ideas are successful, whether they're working, whether anybody wants to watch them or not. There's no guarantee that they'll make any money because people still have to watch the video in order to make some money, but it gives you that platform to give it a try. So I've been asking people to start thinking about what videos they want to make. It might be on finance, it might be a demonstration video or a review video, or it could be an amusing video or anything you can think of. But what I have asked everybody is to make them as professional as possible. So make sure you've got a good camera, make sure you've got a microphone so that the sound quality is good. Make sure you've worked out exactly what you're going to do for your video before you start it. So have a start, a middle and an end. Have a title in mind and make it as fun or informative or educational as possible so that people want to watch more of your videos. That's the concept. So that's basically what Joe Blogs 2 is. In terms of what I'm asking right now, I need everybody to keep watching those videos. We're not quite there yet. We're around about 3,100 watch hours in. So we need to get to 4,000. So we're over three quarters of the way there, but we need to keep watching those videos. So if you get a chance, please jump over to Joe Blogs 2, watch one or two of the videos or click on the playlist, let it run through in the background while you're doing something else. And once we hit that magical 4,000 hours, then we're ready to go on this experiment. So thanks for watching this part of the video and thanks for watching this whole video all the way to the end.